Okay, good. I'm glad you straightened that out. Then the other question, also a very good one. What does a trend seem to be? Is it a sharp upward curve or down or has been going on, do you think, for years? Or is this something relatively recent with a big upswing? I have reports going back to 1992, Rick. Um, many more reports starting around 1997. But I can tell you that the a real upsurge, a spike, uh, has occurred since December of last year, January, February of this year. The trend uh, seems to be uh, up sharply at that time and continuing at very high levels uh, over many American cities. I can name a few off the top of my head. Go Dallas, right at, uh, Dallas. Dallas, Phoenix, uh, Bakersfield again, Kansas City, um, uh, Asheville, North Carolina keeps coming up uh, in recent days again and again. Great. That's where my mom is. Okay. My um, mom's in Asheville all over the United States, as well as re more remote rural communities. I'm thinking of Salisaw, Oklahoma, uh, a big one for low-level spraying, many sick people, outbreak of lupus, which I suspect is uh, really mycoplasma fermentans uh, ex exhibiting the same symptoms as lupus. Salisaw, also important because we have a goo sample that was examined by Dr. Uh, Greg Hanford and some folks out in California. Mm -hmm. um, when are we going to have the results of some of these um, samples taken? Well, we have some results, as a matter of fact. Uh, of actual samples taken. Now, you talked to us about Joe uh, and Joe's <laughs> chemical ridden body <laughs> yes um but with regard to actual samples you have res results uh. yes we do well of course we have the the oakville california uh, oakville washington i'm sorry those samples uh with the pseudomonas fluorescence the other bacteria may have been background contamination uh inconclusive we have the angel hair fallout uh, collected from salas oklahoma in october 97 I talked to Dr. Hanford. He was with four other guys looking at it, he said, at a community college a lab near Bakersfield, right. and they found an unusually big bacteria, an enterobacteria, that they thought mm, looked modified, and they managed to pin the family down to E. coli, salmonella, anthrax, and shigella. It came out of that family, but they couldn't, they, they just simply couldn't identify the species of that uh, bacillus. So we may be looking at designer stuff here. We are definitely looking at uh, things that have come out of research laboratories as well as bacteria that could be present uh, in the soil. I find it interesting, if I can use that word, suggestive, perhaps a better word, that the recent outbreaks of flesh-eating staff you, you're aware of are in Delaware, Michigan, Rockford, Illinois in the last few weeks. Uh, this staff A belongs to the same family as Pseudomonas. We keep seeing that Pseudomonas uh, strep and uh, anthrax. So we have a, a very active family of uh, pathogens cropping up in the mainstream news. I noticed that the Pseudomonas arganosa is manufactured by the my old friends, the American Type Tissue Culture Corporation of Maryland. These are the folks who supplied at least 72 shipments of germ warfare culture to a person named Saddam Hussein. Uh, you can find the invoice numbers and the shipping dates in my book, Bringing the War Home. I'll quickly add this was done legally, but I keep running into the ATTCC in my investigations. Finally, we do have um, a sample that I've been personally active in uh, promoting. I just sent a check off to pay for the, the lab work. This is important, Art, because it's the, the best uncontaminated sample I have seen in my research taken from an aluminum-sided building. There's no possibility of soil contamination here. Mm -hmm. It was taken by a person very skilled, uh, had expertise in uh, health, a journalist who documented it with still photographs, which I have, videotape, which I have, very well-documented sample of the goo. This fell on a 
a building uh, in a city in the United States within the last year, fell out of an airplane, splattered this building with a brown colored uh, goo. We got this into a research lab last week, and the biologists who looked at this asked, where did we get this biohazard material? What? Well, biohazard? Biohazard. The lab was very concerned because they said, now normally samples take several days to grow. You put it in a culture and see if you can get it to grow. Right. These samples, they said, flowered not even 48 hours in the pet Petri dish. They said, they told us these things are loaded with viable living bacteria. We have never seen anything grow as quickly as this. It was all over the plate. Where did you get these samples? All right. Some people would say, look, uh, somehow there was a discharge of human waste from an airplane. Could it have been that? People did say that. The media came out. They, they asked the FAA, and we found that, first of all, airliners do not discharge waste. Those are closed uh, containers. No, you're, you're absolutely Secondly, correct. Secondly, it's blue-tinted. It's dyed with a disinfectant. Blue. There is no possibility, said the health inspectors who came out there, that this is human waste from an aircraft. And in, in a few seconds, I'm going to demonstrate that um, what we found, what this lab found this week was certainly not human waste. I've just got the lab report in my hands. Uh, this is science. It's signed off. We have the numbers. I will admit this is only uh, one test. We have a second test taken from another state of similar substance, and we're in the process of um, checking that to see if we get a cross-correlation. But here's what we found. Here's what the lab found from this goo. Again, a very good, clean sample. Mm -hmm. They found Pseudomonas fluorescence. Mm -hmm. Seen that before in similar samples of the goo. Again, this causes very bad, can cause very bad uh, blood infections in humans. The Pseudomonas can use and does use hydrocarbons. Uh, it loves them. It dines on petroleum. Pseudomonas uh, fluorescence was manufactured in great quantities at one time to consume oil spills. So you could put it in something like JP8 ethylene dibromide, and it would have a perfect matrix to survive and thrive as it fell to the ground. We did not find, I must quickly say, uh, ethylene dibromide in this particular sample. We weren't looking for it. We went back to the lab. Technicians said that they would probably have noted it. We did find something else, though. We found a fungus, Streptomyces. This is very unusual because you don't find this in outdoor samples hardly ever. This what, is what very, the hell very is that? unusual. What is it? Well, you make streptomycin. You make a vaccine with this particular fungus. <sighs> you make vaccine in a laboratory. Now, this wasn't the vaccine. This was the progenitor, if you like. We don't understand what it was doing in a sample with um, pathogens, but we also uh, were interested in the lab report that found a uh, bacillus, another one of these names, that, a very long name, Let's just say, and this is very, very telling, this particular uh, bacillus contains a restriction enzyme. What's that? Well, yeah. it's an enzyme that can be used for manipulating DNA. It would be used mm. in a research lab. It would never, ever be found in the natural environment. In fact, Art, it is on the U.S. government's rebase list of restricted enzymes. What? It's on the list of restricted enzymes because it can be used to shift the DNA from one organism into another. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, this just gets worse and worse and worse by the minute. I agree. He's to the Rockies. You're on the air with William Thomas. Hello. Hi. Hi. This is Phyllis. Hi, Phyllis. Alexandria, Virginia, WWRC out of Bethesda. Right. Three weeks ago, I got a, like a survey call from my health insurance, and um, I'm 58, and I thought they would worry about pneumonia shots if I was a little older. Mm -hmm. But the last question they asked me on the survey was, have you had your pneumonia shot? 
And I said, no. Well, today I received a card that says take part in the health insurance, I'm not going to name it, pneumococcal immunization program. Um, let's see, call your primary care physician, discuss it with your primary care, fill out the form and return the questionnaire, use blue or black ink, um, mark the appropriate boxes and responses. Right. Put down the date that you received the, the vaccine. Um, then there's another box that says, my primary care physician has advised me not to take it. And I do not, my third one is, I do not intend to receive it. Mm -hmm. But I thought, in, you know, after what we, I'd heard on your show, that was very, very odd. It's especially odd that we are not hearing from the Center of Disease Control or our government uh, saying, hey, folks, we have a pneumonia epidemic. Take the shots. We're getting silence. Uh, therefore, I can only conclude that this is not a, quote, normal outbreak or uh, they're trying to hide something. And yet, uh, not only do we have a caller, a Phyllis, with a insurance form, uh, we also have uh, I'm in contact with one gentleman in the hospital who was given a very lengthy questionnaire saying if you do not fill this out and answer all of these questions, we're not going to treat you. Hmm. Well, I, you know, I think that's against the law. Or, uh, you know, if, they go, if you go in, particularly in an emergency situation, uh, and you're in some distress respiratory or something like that, and they don't treat you... Um, they get big fines. I hope so. They get in big trouble. Wild card line, you're on the air with William Thomas. Hello. Hello, this is Jean. Art, uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you. And to you, where are you? I live in the L.A. area in California. Yes, okay. Okay, anyways, I have one question, and I have a couple other comments for you. In July, I came down with meningitis, and I'm very isolated. Well, I'm pretty isolated where I live. I live up in the hills of the San Fernando Valley. And I also am retired, so I'm not working. I'm not around a lot of people, so who knows how I got the meningitis. Mm -hmm. About three weeks ago, I saw a very narrow X. Obviously, here in the L.A. area, we have a lot of uh, airplane traffic. Of course. And these, it was like a very narrow X. And now, I've, how high are these usually? And this thing did not dissipate. And I could see it moving very slowly, but... Not like clouds where you'll see a little bit of a change in the shape. Sure. And so, anyways, that's my first my question on that. And then I'll have a couple comments just briefly afterwards. Okay. William, uh, is that... Hi, William. <laughs> is that... Hello, Gene. Your meningitis could be, underlying could be, uh, could have been caused by an infection of pseudomonas arganosa. It is known for causing meningitis, and I keep seeing meningitis among developed symptoms in my investigation into these chemtrails that are woven at two altitudes, very high, in excess of 34, 35,000 feet. Uh -huh. You can just get a sense that the aircraft is at very high altitude, hard to um, pick out any detail. And also at around nine to 10,000 feet, where you can see the aircraft more clearly, those two altitudes. How long do these stay in the sky usually? For a couple of hours okay. or even an afternoon, depending on how thickly they're laid down. Multiple aircraft laying a grid-like pattern can uh, make these things persist for an afternoon. Well, a single aircraft, uh, an hour, two hours, or longer. This was an afternoon, and at the time that I had the meningitis, there was an outbreak of approximately 400 people in the L.A. area that contracted it. Oh, okay. really? Yeah. Well, thank you. Oh, and to my comments, um, I said my prayers for Richard, and I'm glad that he's okay. Thank you. And uh, have you, you, might, you, might, you might say some for William while you're at it after listening this morning. Oh, really? Yes. Lots of prayers for you, too. You will be safe. We will take care of you. Uh, my, my second comment does have to do with uh, safety and health. Uh, have you ever heard about the use of castor bean to simulate a massive heart attack and it cannot be traced without 
Well, you know, you know what, uh, thank you, what Dr. Day said. Dr. Day said anybody can cause a murder, but it takes a real expert to cause a natural death. That's what Dr. Day said. I'm Mark Bell. The time. Tonight featuring Coast to Coast AM from the 17th of March, 1999. <laughs> Thomas again. William, I've got two things I want to read you very quickly, then we'll go back to the phones. Okay. William mentioned intestinal problems. This is from Don in California. I'm a healthy, active male, 33 years old, just after Christmas. I developed intestinal pain and flu-like symptoms, no fever, but very tired. The symptoms would come and go every few days. It lasted until late February. I remember telling friends, this is the weirdest flu I've ever had, just when you're normal it hits you again then about a week before i got sick i noticed a sticky film on my vehicles plural in the morning at that time i told a friend of mine how i'd wash the car and then it'd be all dirty again the next morning with this damn oily film it's now beginning to make sense to me don in california sound about right Sounds about right. I just sigh when I hear that story because I've heard others like it. And we seem to be going from upper respiratory to gastrointestinal with this stuff. Yeah, and this. Uh, Art, listening to Mr. Thomas talk tonight, he mentioned meningitis. This big warning at the top of the facts. It says, Art, here in northeast Ohio, this is from Dale in Akron, mm -hmm. uh, in the last two months we've had four cases of meningitis. None of the people ever had contact with any of the others. Two hospitalized, two died. One a four-year-old, one child, and the other a 27-year-old female teacher. It all happened within five weeks, and we've got contrails here all the time. Possibly a connection? I do have reports from Akron on contrails, and I would ask uh, listeners to please participate in this very important investigation for all of us by sending me uh, news clippings of these meningitis outbreaks and similar outbreaks of disease. Uh, you'll find my address on my website. All right, um, and again, uh, if you want to email, if you're in the media, you want to follow up on the story, you damn well ought to want to follow up on the story. Uh, it's Wilco, W-I-L-C-O, at islandnet.com, one word, islandnet.com, um, and, and you'll be able to email uh, William directly. His website is linked to my website. It's got tildes and stuff in it, so if that's hard for you, go to the website you're used to, mine, and just scroll down to William Thomas's name and click on the link. You can do more reading. His book is Bringing the War Home, and you can get it by calling one triple eight. Six nine zero one two seven seven. All right. Um, first time. Co no. Uh, no. I shouldn't be going there yet. Let's go here. East of the Rockies. You're on the air with William Thomas. Where are you, please? Hi there. Uh, this is Marty, and I'm listening in uh, Brooklyn, New York, on 770 WABC. WABC. Yes, sir. And uh, I have a comment and a question for William. Sure. Um, my first. Uh, first, a comment and. It has something to do with the story that Art said at the, just after the break, because two years ago I was down in Tampa, Florida, and uh, in the morning I left with my cousin to go, go get cigarettes, and the, the car was covered with dust, it looked like. Dust? And, uh, yeah, it was a, uh, that's the best way I can explain it, as if it, somebody was sawing wood around it, but it was everywhere, even. And I asked him, uh, asked him what it was, what is this? And uh, he complained and he moaned, and he said, well, sometimes the planes come over, and they dust for potato bugs, he said. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, you know, I just, I was, okay, I figured he knows, you know, and he complained that it, it would leave spots on his car and uh, they wouldn't tell anybody when they were doing this. They would just do it randomly. And I thought if they are doing that, if it is, you know, just innocently uh, spraying for bugs, uh, I, I know that, William, that you're trying to get information out and I appreciate that. And, uh, I think uh, I, I applaud you for doing it, but I think some people might be getting terrified unduly 
And that brings me to my question. No, that is right. I mean, uh, uh, how the hell is somebody supposed to know the difference between contrails and chemtrails? That's my question. And, and Yeah, and I understand that this is going to cause great worry. It's worrying me. Um, so, yeah, to you, um, William, again, I guess that we were talking about that a little while ago. God, how do we help people understand what they should be concerned about and what's okay. Uh, life in this country is getting tougher by the minute. I agree, and again, I really don't want to be a purveyor of fear. I hope I can be a messenger for uh, awareness and public action toward uh, their elected officials and toward the, the media to instigate an investigation, demand some answers and accountability. Uh, we have enough stress in our lives already. There are plenty of crop dusters flying around spraying for various things. By the way, you don't want to be exposed to that spray any more than anything else. That's uh, very nasty, those pesticides. In fact, as we found tonight, um, some of these pesticide uh, elements or substances or compounds are being found uh, in Joe Burton's body, so we don't want to be exposed to that, nor do we want to run from every aircraft and every uh, normal legitimate contrail that we see. But if the contrails linger, or especially if they are being uh, dispensed behind an aircraft at a fairly low altitude, that is an aircraft, a, a big a big jet airplane that is not high and hard to see in the sky, but pretty much right up close and personal. Uh, beware, there is no possible way contrails can form from a jet aircraft uh, at nine or 10,000 feet. That is a very good indicator that something's going on. An X pattern in the sky is also another sure uh, mark of this particular beast. And you've had eyewitnesses say, through telescopes and binoculars, they have actually seen this stuff coming out nozzles. Absolutely correct. People viewing uh, these aircraft with uh, high-power binoculars and telescopes have independently told me that they have seen the, the probe, the big boom, uh, coming angling down from the rear of the aircraft. Again, we're seeing these chemtrails uh, coming from the tails of identified tanker aircraft with engines on their wings. Here is a fax from a physician who I will not name. Art, whether these are epidemiologic studies of an offensive or defensive nature and or related to electromagnetic experimentation and or question mark, this is not good news and we're worried about joe camel where's george carlin when you need him seriously art this is serious as usual you're at least three to six months or more ahead of the news media curve uh we do a lot of that here um william we're ahead of the uh, regular media by uh, qu quite a bit frequently and i've got a feeling this is another one of those times we need to get this into in order to either knock it down or to prove it, you've got to go to the next step. And the next step means the New York Times. It means something in Time magazine or uh, something on the Associated Press. It means that. And that's the only way you're going to get the kind of oomph you need, study-wise and money-wise, to either prove this or knock it down. You're absolutely right, Mike last eight weeks of research have maybe put aside all paying project and I'm going along on donations from listeners such as uh, uh, the folks listening in tonight well I very much appreciate their contributions to this study I would delight uh, really in having this knocked down and disproven so I could get my life back and go on with other things Art I am convinced that is not repeat not going to happen while I am not certain and I do not have a proof uh, t to make assertions of why this is going on, I can definitely say and prove that it is going on. We are being sprayed with something. They do contain pathogens. They do appear to be altering the weather. Hey, William, how old are you? Fifty. Fifty. 
How's your heart? Great. Heart's in good shape? You bet. Just checking. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with William Thomas. Hello. Hi. Hi. Ben from KSFO, San Francisco 560. Yes, sir. Um, hello, William. Hello. Thank you for your good work. You're welcome. I only started noticing these, what I've been calling them air sprays because of Art Bell, in over the San Francisco Bay on January 29th. Well, they've been testing on you guys before. Uh, February 10th. Since it was all on clear days and with a sea breeze blowing to the east, I thought, okay. But on the 22nd, they sprayed and I got an illness, which I've never had and never heard of, that entered my, uh, every joint in my back, took four days to continue down the back all the way to the feet. <laughs> Meanwhile, again, now we have the Marines doing their so-called war games here. Yeah, I hear they're attacking your uh, uh, they're yeah. in Monterey. Okay. No, no, they're in San Francisco. They're in Oakland. Oh, they're, really? And they're supposedly, <laughs> they've given many different stories. First of all, they needed to check out their new Palm computers uh, for downtown metropolitan to protect the people. And so there was a big uproar. And then the Pentagon released a news flash that uh, the real purpose of this was to stir up volunteers for the militia, uh, military. However, when I came home tonight, I noticed that they had laid another three strips over Oakland, directly over where Lawrence Livermore is. And listening to you talk, here's my, my thought, my question. Uh, this sounds like some kind of horrific Devious, unbelievable combination of because for a while I was thinking maybe they're trying to lay down a cover against the guidance systems if if at other times they're not laying sprays of other things because they're obviously sprays and now what you're talking about harp sounds like the original radio magnetic accelerators uh, the whole thing is just uh, incredible. I yeah, know. do you want to monologue on that a little bit? William? Yes, we can say that there is no possible way that an artificial cloud cover can be laid over the entire continental United States or even maintained over uh, regions to hide military or other activity from photographic satellites it's irrelevant anyway since other satellites use radar imaging that is very precise and would look right through your cloud cover so i'm not quite buying that one people said what about these uh corona mass ejections on the sun even as we talk tonight we're having the biggest solar flares uh, in recorded history huge things gamma rays x-rays all heading towards the ionosphere uh, that harp is messing with trying to tear a hole in mm -hmm. uh, are they laying down a cloud cover to protect us from the rays of these solar explosions well sorry the gamma and x-rays go right through the cloud cover so i think we'll have to discard that notion as well I can only hope that the Marines in San Francisco are not using live ammunition as they did in Texas. Texas, I know. Um, it says on my website right now, we keep track of this uh, literally by the minute, current solar x-ray activity is M-class flare right now. Mm-hmm. So I pass that one on. Uh, yeah. First time caller line, you're on the air with William Thomas. Good evening. Good evening. Morning, Good evening. actually. Of course, you might be in Hawaii. It'd still be evening. Where are you, sir? Birmingham, Alabama. No, it's definitely morning in Alabama. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you're on the air. From WERC 960 in Birmingham. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thomas, I saw the rainbow between two contrails this afternoon in Birmingham, Alabama. Did you see it with your uh, naked eye, or were you wearing sunglasses at the time? Uh, my naked eye and I hopefully have some t uh, photographs being developed as I speak to confirm this, and also there's a massive grid patterns over Birmingham this afternoon. A what? I'm sorry. Massive grid patterns? Yes, Birmingham has been on my uh, uh, chemtrail radar uh, recently as well as in previous months uh, for heavy spraying. Is there any way, sir, that that could have been a normal rainbow 
uh, not very good. It lasted for a long time. It did not even it didn't increase in size or anything. It, it stayed between two chemtrails that were going uh, from east to west. Sounds like a chemical signature to me. Now, William, you said that um, what kind of sunglasses? Uh, polarizing sunglasses. Uh, even normal sunglasses uh, should do the trick, but polarizing sunglasses really bring this out. Really bring it out. So if you're looking at a, what a, what's a contrail or you suspect might be a chemtrail, with these glasses, if it's a normal contrail, it's just going to look white, right? Exactly. But if it's a chemtrail, you're now going to see sort of a rainbow of colors in it. Is that is that also accurate? Let's put a maybe in front of that. I'm not certain you'll see it on every observation. I, in other words, I don't want to tell listeners, if you put on sunglasses and don't see a rainbow in the in the trail that it's okay it's, it's okay i don't want to suggest that uh, on the other hand of course if you do see it you are seeing chemicals in the sky okay but wouldn't people say look a contrail is water vapor water vapor um as seen in a rainbow when we have a rainbow in our sky uh acts as a prism and so you you might see multiple colors in water vapor what, what about that try it. Uh, I have never, I've looked at a lot of contrails. I've been a pilot. Uh, try it. I've never seen such a phenomena, a rainbow in a normal uh, ice crystal uh, contrail. The feeling I got making my observation uh, a couple of weeks ago was a, an intuitive feeling that this is uh, an oily or chemical compound. And I think your listeners will recognize the phenomenon of oil in a puddle uh, in the water, you get swirls and colors. Same, uh, uh, feeling and, and sight of this phenomena in the sky. William, we're out of time. The, uh, your book is Bringing the War Home, $22.95. Now, um, if you would like to, if you're in the press, you would like to make further inquiries, maybe do your own investigation. Maybe you're not one of those lazy little bastards. Uh, well, excuse me, lazy little uh, media people who don't follow up on things and don't really do their own investigation and run with the pack. If, if you're not one of the pack people, you can contact William at Wilco, W-I-L-C-O, at islandnet, that's one word, islandnet.com. And I guess that's about all we're going to have time for right now.